Hi, welcome to the Question of Scale podcast. I'm Davy Phillip, and here we're going to be imagining a cooperative community-led approach to regional resilience. And I'm Oliver Moore, and SCALE here stands for Supply Chains and Local Economies, and we're exploring how we strengthen our resilience in our regions to the shocks and disruptions we are facing. And this initiative is from the Green European Foundation, uh, which has been delivered by Cultivate, the Sustainable Ireland Co-op, and the Green Foundation Ireland, and is part of a climate emergency economy transnational project. Uh, the initiative is made possible with the financial support of the European Parliament um, to the Green European Foundation. So in this project, we published a short paper, and this is a podcast we've also, we're also producing to promote the paper, and we'd be launching a longer illustrated article where we explore in more detail some of what has emerged from conversations we've had with the community. Some of those issues include, for example, uh, the solidarity, the social and solidarity economy, uh, just transition, cooperatives in general, uh, platform cooperatives. Uh, so there's a range of areas that come up, community well building as well, a range of areas that come up that are quite interesting for this idea of regional resilience. We're going to start with uh, a little interview with Dirk Holmans, uh, who is the coordinator of the Belgian green think tank Oikos and the co-president of the Green European Foundation. Dirk, uh, tell us briefly what Jeff does. Well, actually, I think the best way to describe Jeff is a platform implementing projects in a centralized and also in a decentralized way because we are a strong network of political foundations, institutions all over Europe, from Finland to Greece, from Spain to North Macedonia, working together on key issues just as, cl just as climate and environment, just transition, uh, basic income, and so sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, so to make, I would say, Europe more progressive, because you can look at Europe as a kind of problematic working together or not working together of member states, and sadly some sometimes one leaving. But if you look at all these uh, progress progressive foundations, uh, also local projects, uh, then we have a vision of Europe as a progressive, hopeful continent. So that's briefly, I would say, the core message of Jeff. We want to invest in a public debate, in the European public debate, to make it more progressive, to make sure that the key ecological challenges, climate change, the collapse of biodiversity, are answered in a re relevant way. Fantastic, Dirk. So, and thanks for Jeff's support for this Question of Scale project uh, and your input to our webinars uh, and to the paper that we link your article in. So you've said that uh, resili in your Resilience Under Shock article, uh, that the guiding principle for recovery should be resilience. Why so? Why is why is resilience so important? Well, resilience means that as a system, and I'm talking about uh, social ecological ecology. Sorry, I'm going to start again. So um, we are talking about resilience of a system, and I'm talking about a social ecological system, not an ecosystem or not part of society. Um, we will be confronted with many shocks. Actually, some shocks are already happening. Look at the heat waves. And so it's very uh, essential that our system is not only uh, reacting to shocks, trying to absorb them, but also changing its course so we can, can avoid shocks. So resilience is about a system that can keeps, keep on functioning while there are shocks, while also changing course in order to avoid future shocks and of course to be honest also a bad system can be resilient you could say that capitalism is very resilient mm -hmm. so it's a content that also needs a kind of uh, normative embedding but if we embed it in a progressive uh, setting it's important because look at the corona crisis it shows us we have an economy we have a health system which is not resilient there was a need of masks. There were no masks available. We uh, discovered that some medicines are only produced in India. So when India says we will in, uh, install a ban on the export, we don't have the medicines anymore. And you see our system falling apart. So 
By making our systems resilient, we are preparing ourselves for the future. And in my article, I talk about four dimensions of uh, resilience. The first is short feedback loops. It's about information on good and bad consequences of what we are doing. How fast do this information reach us? And do we use it to change our course? The second is uh, modularity. I just gave an example. If only one module in the world, India, produces some medicines, then we are very fragile because then if this model doesn't function anymore, doesn't want to share everything with all the world, and we are in trouble. So that's clear. I think also the third dimension is quite clear. It's about diversity. And to understand this, just think about the farm. If a farm only has one crop on its acres and there's a disease or there is drought, and all that maybe then all the harvest is lost. But if this farmer puts 10 different crops on its acres, then probably some will be able to resist the disease, others will be able to resist a uh, drought or a hot summer. And we have a kind of stable, maybe not a maximum, but we have a stable harvest. So also in our society, we need diversity, organizing things in different ways. The government has to organize things by public services, of course, there's a market with uh, companies, but also there are citizens, organisms themselves in commons, in co corporations, so corps. So this diversity is very important. And by this, we make our economy and our society more resilient. The last dimension is something which is mostly forgotten. It's social capital. We saw with the Corona crisis, suddenly people organize themselves, uh, organizing networks of sol solidarity, uh, coming together, producing masks. Big companies were not able to deliver them, people were able to produce them. And so social capital is about not only people coming together very quick, but also what they are able to produce as uh, tools, as products, and strengthening society. And if we take those four dimensions into account, while changing our society, I think we will uh, end up with a stronger society, which is more capable of delivering a good life for all within planetary boundaries. So now we're going to explore the outputs of the wider uh, Green European Foundation Climate Emergency Programme uh, that SCALE was part of. Um, with us, we have Jonathan Essex from the Greenhouse in the UK and Bran van de Glind from Groenlinks in the Netherlands. Welcome, Jonathan and Bran. So you've been working on complementary initiatives in the UK and the Netherlands that are also supported by Jeff, both are exploring and sharing ideas how we break through the obstacles currently preventing us from reaching a zero carbon goal. Tell us, Jonathan, in the UK, what was, it, what was your program about? So in the UK, we, we were looking at, you know, what are the links between trade, infrastructure and industry? Um, so I'll give you one example. You know, at the moment in the UK, we import iron ore and coal vast distances to burn in the UK in, 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 bla in, in blast first in the in UK to make steel. Um, and, and then we both import and export vast volumes of steel as well. So the, the current process of making steel is reliant on trade, trade of goods. Um, the industry produces carbon, and then that is used uh, for the infrastructure which, which funds our economy and makes the whole problem bigger. Mm -hmm. Now, we were looking at, you know, if, if you shifted to, for example, electric arc furnaces, and we use the scrap steel which we have in the UK, um, then we wouldn't need to import iron ore, we wouldn't need to import coal, we wouldn't need to export scrap, and we would reduce the imports and the exports because we'd be making the kind of steel in the UK that we need to use in the UK. But basically what we did start with is say, well, how big is the problem? So how much carbon emissions are there associated with the transport element of international trade? And what were the results then? You, you were looking at blockers and enablers. What were the sort of, what did you find? Well, the first thing we did is we found that it's a very big problem. Uh, we, we found that the 
total amount of carbon just for the product. We didn't look at packaging, just for the products which we ship, we fly, uh, we train and, and, and we truck in and out of the UK. It's 36 million tonnes of carbon that isn't reflected in the UK's carbon budget. It isn't reflected in anyone's carbon budget because these international shipping and international aviation emissions, which is the bulk of it, on in the Paris Climate Agreement, no one's taking responsibility for it. So we found a gaping hole in the way we currently do climate. Um, and, and we and we found that uh, one of the blockers, I think the biggest blocker which we discussed in, in our part of the project was called trade. As the UK is uh, planning to leave the European Union, it's looking to do these trade deals with the US and many others. Um, but climate isn't part of the trade deal. And as I've just set out, you know, trade currently isn't part of the, the deal, which we call the Paris Climate Agreement. Mm. So it sounds like it's easy to identify the blockers. Uh, did you surface any enablers? I think our biggest enabler at the moment was just identifying that there's a, there's, there's a, a problem and better publicising uh, that so that there is an awareness. Because I think the biggest problem at the moment we have is that, that while, while we focus on what's obvious and immediate, um, things which are further related, th these global connected issues aren't really being, being picked up. Um, I, th I think, yeah, th I'll maybe come back to neighbours in a separate bit, but I would, I would say at this stage, this project was mainly identifying blockers at the global scale. Yeah. And unless you alleviate the blockers, uh, you know, what you might enable to bring a local economy about simply isn't going to happen. Yeah. Well, let's look at the other project, Netherlands. We might come back if we've got time. But, Bram, what did your project in Holland focus on? Yeah, thanks. So our, our scope was slightly different. We also looked at the harder to debate, harder to abate uh, sector within the wider Jeff project. But we focus specifically on energy intensive industries, on Dutch energy intensive industries. And we did that because just the steel, oil refinery and chemistry industry together, they account for around a quarter of all emissions in the Netherlands. So this is really a core sector to address. Mm -hmm. And our project really focused on the question, what sort of policy do we need to get rid of these emissions? What should government do? Mm -hmm. um, and to find out, we talked with a lot of experts. We talked also with people from industry itself. Uh, we assessed academic literature. And in the end, we'll bundle all this together in a, in a report. And some external authors will also write chapters. Um, and we're finalizing uh, this report at the moment. Mm -hmm. So both your report, Bram and Jonathan, will they be avail available in the Green European Foundation or in both in the Greenhouse and Groenlinks? Well, the, our, our final output, the big report, will be written in Dutch. But there will also be an English version of it, which will be sort of... A, small version, uh, but that's, that one will be published on the, on the Jeff website also. And Jonathan, where will we find the results of your project? Uh, both on the, the Green European Foundation and, and the Greenhouse Think Tank websites. And maybe for both of you, where does this lead us? What's your next step? Are you going to continue uh, going deeper into this issue? Brad? Uh, I could start on this. We are considering to, to, get, to do a follow-up on this because we found that hydrogen is probably a key technology that is going to be required to, to reduce emissions from uh, energy-intensive industries. But there's a lot of things that we don't know yet about hydrogen. They always say hydrogen is sort of... Uh, it won't, we won't run out, run out of it, but there is still scarcity because it takes energy to produce it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's... Lots of questions, where are we going to produce this uh, renewable energy? Perhaps it's going to be produced in Northern Africa, where there's a lot of sun. Possibly with solar energy, you could produce hydrogen. And then that could be shipped to the UK, Ireland, or the Netherlands, so we can use it to produce steel. There's lots of questions around this, so we think this is an important uh, issue to look into further. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan, what's your next steps at Greenhouse? Well, we're, we're currently working on a, on a report which is looking at um, transport infrastructure and, and infrastructure in general and how it's, it's, it's the development of infrastructure, which quite often is that which, which enables this trade to happen. So there is a market driver uh, 
or economic driver of comparative advantage that separates where is the cheapest place for to employ workers, where materials come from, how big a scale you have a factory and, and, and where the markets are, which is causing separation and globalization. But also there is a a government role in this, that governments are planning and building infrastructure, whether it be ports or airports or roads, um, w w which is making this, this transfer happen. Uh, and what we found in our initial research this, just this last month is that um, overall in the UK over the last 18 years, uh, while transport emissions have fallen slightly, what's gone up is the emissions of trucks and the emissions of planes. So currently what's happening is that it's it's global transport, it's global trade that is actually holding back the climate emergency. So we've we've now got a, a year's delay. We, we were going to have a, a, a climate conference in Glasgow this year. Now that's been put back to next year. So we have another year really to highlight how these hard to reach sectors, how industry, how infrastructure, how trade really need to change. I mean. You talked. You asked before about our neighbours. What are the positives? Well, we we're really in in this looking to change the overall structure and culture of our society and our economy in, in, into a place where we use less product and it lasts for longer. Mm -hmm. But for that, we've got to move away from a consumer based culture where the aim is to maximise how much product we flow through our system, uh, how cheaply we can produce it in both people. And planetary terms, um, and and, the, and as we all know that you know the costs are externalised, and, and they'll be borne by our future generations. Yeah. Well, brilliant! Thanks for joining us, Bram and Jonathan. Uh, it's really interesting, very complimentary, uh, and good luck to you. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. So, in our paper, a question of scale, we focused on one of the more holistic approaches to economics with Carol Power from the Center for Cooperative Studies in UCC. So welcome, Carol. So uh, Donut Economics can you, from Kate Roward, can you give us an introduction to Donut Economics? What is it exactly? Well, uh, Donut Economics is a concept that was developed by uh, Kate Rayworth, who is a UK economist. And she developed the concept while she was working with Oxfam around 2011-2012. Um, and having studied economics at university, she had hoped that that would equip her with the knowledge and uh, skills that she needed to tackle you know, some of the, the major uh, challenges facing the world, uh, environmental and social. But she had become somewhat disillusioned with uh, economics and its emphasis on uh, conventional growth models, uh, you know, emphasizing uh, the need for a constant uh, increase in GDP um, as a measure of success. So she began to think about, you know, if we put human development um, at the center of, of uh, development, um, how would that look? If we draw that out, how would it look? And what she came up with was a, a donut shape. So she, she describes it as the only type of donut probably that's actually good for us. Um, so if you can picture in your mind's eye um, a donut, so the type with a hole in the middle. Um, so the idea uh, for human development is to get everyone into the donut, uh, into the substance of the donut. So we have an inner ring and an outer ring. Uh, the inner ring is the social foundation um, and that provides um, you know, the very basics that we need, uh, water, uh, nutritious food, um, decent housing, uh, decent income and work opportunities, uh, through to what's needed for social justice. Uh, so things like social equity, uh, gender equality and political voice. So we need a solid social foundation to support people to stay in the donut. And when there's a shortfall in any of those aspects, um, and of course, we know that, uh, for instance, uh, you know, it tends to be, you know, deprivation tends to be uh, multidimensional. So um, if we have somebody who is unable to um, uh, make a decent living, then they're also likely to experience uh, deprivation and inequality into health and uh, in relation to health and education and so on. Um, 
then they're more likely to fall out of that safety net. So in that case where the social foundation weakens and um, the individuals or communities fall into that hole in the donut. So they essentially fall out of the donut. And then in the outer ring of the donut, we have the ecological ceiling. So we need to achieve development that meets the needs of humanity without breaching that ecological ceiling. And when we overshoot planetary boundaries, so when we uh, increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, when we pollute the air and when we um, uh, pollute the water, then we're breaching those planetary boundaries. Um, and that's where we end up in trouble, where we have uh, issues now, of course, like uh, climate change, uh, like um, loss of biodiversity and so on. Um, so essentially, we want to keep everyone in the donut, uh, supported by that social foundation and the ecological ceiling. OK, Carol, that's a, it's a very interesting concept. It covers uh, the socio-ecological parameters of uh, what's you know crucial in the world right now? But can you give us any practical examples um, where it's translated into action? Okay, so um, as you say, it's an interesting theory, uh, but it's more than just a theory. So there is real progress in turning this from a radical concept into transformative action. So um, the Donut Economics Action Lab um, has been set up to achieve this. Um, and it's essentially um, an action lab experimenting with ways of translating the donut uh, into reality. Uh, so the Donut Economic Action Lab, or, or DEAL for short, works with communities, um, with local government and administration, uh, with businesses and a whole range of uh, actors who are inspired by the idea of donut economics. And in September of this year, they launched an online community platform where people who are interested in um, donut economics um, and working on uh, making do the donut a reality uh, in their communities, in their cities, um, can share insights and experiences and the tools that they have uh, developed to translate uh, the concept of donut economics uh, into reality. And, uh, you know, in the face of climate change and other environmental challenges and social challenges. And even now in the context of um, the economic impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, donut economics uh, can really provide a framework to um, develop resilience of regions and of cities. Um, and this has been embraced uh, in, in recent years by um, Portland and Philadelphia in the US. Um, uh, and uh, most recently in Europe, um, in Amsterdam, um, uh, where they've embraced the concept of uh, donut economics. And donut economics provides a framework for us to think about and to pose questions like, um, how can our city or our community or our region become a, a thriving place? Uh, so we're not focused on economic growth, uh, we're focused on uh, thriving. Um, uh, thriving people um, who uh, can flourish uh, in a community that respects the well-being of all people um, and the health of the planet. Um, so to, to translate that into reality, um, we have the idea um, of a city portrait. Um, and of course, at the moment, um, the Donut Economics Action Lab, in conjunction with other organisations and movements like uh, Thriving Cities, has tended to focus um, on uh, scaling down to the city level. But in time, I'm sure, um, and through the, the DEAL platform as well, we'll see how it can be scaled down to, um, to uh, regional level or to um, uh, community level and local level. Um, but essentially, um, the, the city self portrait uh, provides um, a, a framework for looking at the city through four lenses. And um, so the, the uh, local and the global and the social and the ecological. So uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, a city uh, trying to build a self portrait um, of itself, it in, means involving citizens it means involving local organisations, uh, working with local government as well, 
um, to, to ask questions like, what would it mean for the people of our area, of our locality, of our city uh, to thrive uh, based on their own visions and values? And so it's very much um, a partnership approach and, you know, grassroots uh, organisations um, and the involvement of citizens is really central to this. And um, what would the good life uh, look like in terms of, um, you know, how can we provide affordable housing? Um, how can we build strong uh, community networks and social capital? And um, how can we uh, support health and well-being uh, in the, the city or the region? Uh, what kind of transport networks uh, do we provide to uh, enhance connectivity? And then what would it mean for the city to thrive uh, within its natural habitat? So that's the ecological lens. So, um, you know, how could our uh, city's landscapes uh, be designed to um, sequester carbon? Uh, you know, the built environment, how can how can we foster biodiversity? Can we incorporate things like uh, green roofs on commercial uh, buildings? Uh, can we install solar panels on houses to harness um, the power of solar energy? And then, of course, uh, local aspirations also have to be set in the context of global responsibility. And the donut uh, really helps us to see ourselves as global citizens. And um, so, you know, every day from we're all linked into a global system uh, from the breakfast cereal or the tea coffee that we have at breakfast in the morning and um, to the shirt we put on. And, um, you know, it's it, we're linked into uh, long uh, global supply chains. And, you know, we need to think about um, issues like, you know, what would it take for um, our city or our community to respect the well people? well-being of people uh, worldwide um, and often that will involve you know thinking about um, the the working conditions um, of uh, people involved in those supply chains that that uh, manufacture the the products that uh, we use every day and what would it mean for um, the city to respect the whole planet and um, so to use the earth's resources in a responsible way and uh, to treat uh, to treat our environment with respect by um, you know minimizing uh, pollution, minimizing greenhouse gas emissions, um, and developing a, a regenerative uh, economy where we can, uh, for instance, um, you know uh, recycle uh, waste to uh, produce energy and th those kind of things uh, that we can uh, generate a more uh, regenerative economy. Yeah. Great, uh, Carol, that's a fantastic summary of uh, Donut Economics and you can read about it in the paper, uh, A Question of Scale. Okay, we're now joined by Sean McCabe and Sinead Mercier to look uh, at the concepts of a just transition and community wealth building. Uh, Sinead's a consultant on climate law and uh, policy with specific focus on just transition and human rights approaches. And Sean has worked as a policy officer with the Mary Robbins Foundation, and he's currently developing a work stream on just transition with TASC, the think tank for action and social change. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to our podcast, uh, Sinead and Sean. So Sinead, first up, in the context of the climate emergency, this idea of a just transition has emerged. So can you explain what a genuinely just transition actually means? Um, so the phrase just transition, uh, I suppose it's been popularized because it's been included in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. So I'm sure um, your, your listeners would understand what that was, kind of a signed by 192 countries. And what they agreed was that when the um, countries are cutting their carbon emissions, they will do so uh, in a manner that won't harm the decent work and um, conditions of the, the of workers. Uh, and it would also kind of be in, in line with kind of the right to development as well. So, uh, but it also has kind of much longer history as well. It's basically that you don't leave people behind um, when you are moving or transitioning to a new economy or a new way of, of, of kind of economic organizing. 
And um, the Paris Agreement is very much tied to the, the, the agreement around the Sustainable Development Goals as well, Agenda 2030. They're both kind of seen as... Um, as future future as but um, tied together. Uh, so this idea that you leave no one behind, that you reach the most vulnerable first. So just transition is very much in that same vein, and it comes from a history of kind of labor organizing, 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 uh, particularly in the United States under Tony Mizaki. Um, so he was um, a leader of the of uh, a trade union leader who worked to ensure that the peace movement or the anti nuclear movement didn't mean that kind of people who worked in, in nuclear um, uh, power plants were kind of just kind of discarded, but that they were actually up um, retrained and, and upskilled and benefited from similar to what happened in World War II when soldiers returned, that they uh, got free education uh, at the university level. Um, now, unfortunately, I think that was reserved for um, white people, um, but that a more kind of social justice um, uh, slant would be taken on climate action and workers, environmentalists and health, public health specialists would work together. And that's very much in the vein of the, the Paris Agreement as well. I'm, I'm sure um, Sean, who I think was there, <laughs> uh, will tell you more about that, that, that human rights and climate action um, should be very much tied together and action taken together. So the donor economics that you were discussing just there um, should be under, underpinned by climate action, by um, human rights. So the, the upper limits obviously should be in terms of um, like planetary boundaries, but there are also human boundaries and, and um, human uh, endurance or um, that, that should be kind of considered that we don't leave people behind, that we don't accept the violation of human rights if we are taking, you know, like forestry plantations or offsetting or other actions like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As well, Dan, just in practical terms on a regional level, could you give us an example of what that might mean in, for example, energy? Yeah, so a, a good example, kind of a, a worldwide um, best practice example, um, now it has its flaws, obviously, but will be the Ruhr Valley in, in Germany. So what happened there was that it took around 60 years to trans transition that economy from heavily coal and steel reliant, uh, very industrialized, quite polluted area. Um, there were very little other opportunities. In fact, Bismarck uh, was loath to allow a university to set up in the region because he feared what would happen if working class sons and daughters would be well educated. <laughs> Um, but it um, it became it, it transitioned over sixty years after the phase out of hard coal mining in Germany. And um, once subsidies were removed, it became uneconomic. So they transitioned the region very quite well actually into um, re renewable technology, also kind of um, uh, ha um, also um, because the pollute, the area was so polluted, there was quite a high um, kind of um, very good paying conditions in, uh, say, environmental law specialists or um, ecological specialists who specialise in polluted regions. So that kind of transition took a long time. Um, but how it was done through a, a series of different measures, which I cover in the National Economic and Social Council's report, uh, Four Case Studies, Lessons for Ireland. Uh, and I also highly recommend reading NESC's report in general as well. Um, on just transition, which was recommended by the president, which was amazing. <laughs> but um, what they kind of recommend is that um, social dialogue is, is really number one. So this idea that you engage everybody around the table, which you would know from community wealth building, which we would know from environmental law, which generally always prioritizes public participation. The environment can't speak for itself. So you ensure that those closest to the environment or who rely on that environment speak strongest in, um, in a pool when you're dealing with transition. So the same, uh, the same principles apply. You generally should have trade unions, workers, communities, uh, the company and also local government and government around a table to discuss what will happen to the region, what will happen to the workers. And um, they did this through a series of coal, coal run day. I, I, I apologize um, for my pronunciation there, but what they basically were was that the local government, the national government and um, uh, trade unions 
and the uh, coal companies themselves sat around a table, rolled up the sleeves and hashed out uh, an agreement in terms of redundancies, um, that pensions would be cared for, that people would be redeployed, that no one would just be fired or let go. And there's examples in other countries such as Hazelwood Power Plant, which closed down in Australia. Uh, in uh, quite recently around 2016 and that was kind of an example of uh, um, a bad practice uh, transition where the coal company at issue there, Angers, which was a French multinational, didn't think, didn't really let anybody know what they had planned for the region. They gave, gave around five months notice. Uh, the region had already suffered from a 45-day fire in the coal mine due to lack of health and safety measures. Um, and the community was basically left to fend for itself. And it was very lucky in that they had a quite good Labour government at the time in Victoria um, who stepped in and took up kind of plans that the local community had, had developed with local businesses and local trade unions. Um, so that was an example of where kind of the government and the national government um, and the um, the coal company had kind of been very laissez-faire. They'd left it to kind of develop in its own market-based kind of manner. But luckily, there was a community there that was quite proactive and had worked um, at a local level to develop different ideas for the region uh, with academics, trade unions and, and local businesses. Um, other kind of um, best practice kind of recommendations besides social dialogue would be um, examining what the region itself is good at. So uh, Board Namona, for example, and the Midlands, um, and just, just like the Ruhr uh, Valley, you had kind of very decent pay and conditions in that region, very highly skilled workers, um, very se great sense of pride, great sense of heritage. And the approach that they took was that they realised that attracting in businesses or multinationals was not going to kind of result in long-term work because um, these were highly skilled people. Uh, they weren't going to kind of settle for maybe call centres. Um, that wasn't going to build in the region, is what, what, which is partly what happened in the north of England. Um, but what they did instead was that they kind of conducted skills audits and audits of the region and looked at, well, where are our skills? What can our region do best? And that's where they came up with this highly skilled technical class of lawyers, environmental specialists, ecologists, tourism experts. Uh, it's now a um, UNESCO Her World Heritage Site, the mine. Um, and that was built because they, they realized that the highly polluted region um, actually had developed this highly specialized class who knew how to stop pollution or how to improve polluted areas. Um, so that's another kind of example that you recognise that um, these people are, I suppose, going back to that point that people aren't waste or people aren't resources to just extract from, but can be um, very easily redeployed um, and are quite innovative um, as individuals. We, we all are, I suppose, very creative beings. Um, and to harness that creativity uh, to develop a new idea for the region. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, hey, great. And it's very pertinent, of course, now that we're in the Midlands here in Ireland and um, we will have lots of these issues that the Ruhr Valley had for decades to uh, to deal with. So uh, over to you, Davy. So um, we're going to introduce Sean. Sean, I am I'm delighted you're joining us now to, to bring in uh, a little bit of the context of the new paper that you've just written and has been published by TASC. Uh, called The People's Transition, Community-Led Development for Climate Justice. Uh, fantastic work, Sean. I love the first line. I'm just going to read it out. It's almost a haiku. If climate action is to be fast, it must be fair. If it's to be enduring, it must be inclusive. If it is to benefit from widespread public support, it must share benefits and burdens equitably and fairly. Fantastic. So, Sean, well done on that. And what might be the... Thanks, Davey. It's from your report for strengthening our local economies and ensuring regional resilience. Um, I suppose there's a few. The, the report itself is um, mostly looking at participative approaches. You know, there's there's incredible. You know them yourselves. You are one yourself. You know members of of Ecolease and and other organisations around the world doing incredible stuff on on uh, local community led development. Um, the challenge is really bringing the power 
dynamic to something more balanced between those community-led initiatives and what we're facing into, which is maybe the corporate or uh, multinational uh, corporation agenda around climate change. So um, what we look at in the report is the capabilities um, approach that Amartya Sen would have pioneered and and ask how are cap- how capable are communities of participating in the types of processes that, that Sinead mentions there. I was talking to a friend um, who works with a, um, a development company in the inner city here who um, had a survey to fill out recently for the, for the government. Uh, his community had to do it. He said he had um, to do about 100 favours just to get the survey filled out. And I think that's a familiar feeling to people who um, are trying to work in the empowerment of communities is that people... There's a lack of trust. People don't necessarily see that in responding to these types of surveys or the laissez-faire sort of uh, participation approaches that we have currently. Um, communities don't see tangible benefits returned to them. Uh, the reason being is that power doesn't get transferred through their participation. Uh, so if we want to actually see climate action being different or sustainable development being different, there has to be resources put behind these participative approaches there has to be resources put behind the outcome of the participative approaches which is addressing the needs and wants of communities um true climate action so that's what we were trying to get to was a you have to ensure that people can participate b you have to listen to them and make sure that you understand what they need and want and then c once you understand that you have to put the money behind addressing that true sustainable development true development that doesn't worsen our environmental issues and you, and one of the things you do in the paper is introduce community wealth building as local wealth building. And you've written about this before in, in that article for Carnegie, where we take that Preston model and we expand it into regions. Is there a way that you can quickly introduce what community wealth building is? We're, we're, it's in our paper, of course, but just for the listeners. Yeah, certainly. I guess, um, put simply, it's about uh, the plural ownership of local economies. Um, it can be done in numerous different ways. It, 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 I suppose, was pioneered in Cleveland, Ohio, the Democracy Collaborative over there in the early part of the new millennium. And um, more recently, then, uh, CLES in the UK have taken it up. And, and I think there's 11 uh, cities in the UK now who are pioneering different versions of community uh, uh, wealth building uh, or local wealth building. I, uh, with Preston being the most famous, I think um, at its heart, well, there's a number of things, a um, number of elements. There's obviously pro- progressive procurement through what are called anchor institutions, um, which is a really interesting concept and something that works well in cities where you have municipally owned uh, operations. I, uh, one thing I, I've been thinking a lot about here is, say, uh, in Dublin, we have So many universities uh, chock full of um, students looking for fresh produce and you have then uh, growers in the North North County Dublin who are struggling to um, make a living at times. So like if you were able to connect um, just in in that case, have universities ensure that all of their local, all their produce is procured locally, Mm -hmm. it would have a very significant influence on on, on, uh, the livelihoods of of local farmers. Um, But there's others too, there's um, looking at supply chains for things like um, uh, building projects um, that are municipally run or getting um, companies on side. But the reason the reason it's mo- mostly municipals is the, the sense of place is important. And so you need, if you are to have, um, if you were to have a, a company or a, a, a private enterprise doing it, they, they would have to have some sort of sense of um, commitment to local communities um, and not, not a sort of a throwaway commitment that maybe you might see from the larger multinationals. And Sean, although the model is best known in Cleveland and Preston, do you think it's easy enough to scale that into a regional approach? I don't know about regional. I think I think it's very important to keep it local. The challenge is that you don't have as many anchor institutions in rural areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think that's where the drive to make it a regional model comes in. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to recommend in the report, I don't go into it in great detail because it's quite difficult to extrapolate, is... is We have the largest, possibly the largest um, public procurement in history or the largest public investment in history 
en route in our efforts to avoid climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse. How we tailor that investment, how we consider the spend, like say, say the retrofitting of houses across Ireland, if we broke those up into 26, uh, if, if the Irish government decided to break those up into 26 contracts, one for each county and, and enable the retrofitting cooperative to start in each county, there's jobs in that, there's, there's opportunity. Um, similarly, the, the um, equipment that will be used for the retrofitting, that, that making sure that we, that money is directed towards local cooperatives or local community businesses, the likes of which um, Plunkett and the UK support. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I would see. I don't, think, I don't think scaling it into a regional approach will be difficult. I think we still need to keep it localised. But I think that we could view climate action as a temporary anchor institution something that could catalyze the creation of community businesses which then maybe once the like process of of climate adaptation or climate mitigation has passed they will have the institutional knowledge the capabilities the capacity to do other things Brilliant, Sean. Well, that's a great insight. And um, I recommend everyone looking at that paper, The People's Transition. You can find it on the TASC website. Um, And thank you both Sinead and Sean for joining us here in the Question of Scale podcast. Thank you. So we're now going to explore a historical perspective on cooperatives in Ireland. And we're joined by Tommy Simpson, who's one of the initiators of the Green Foundation Ireland, who are partners in this uh, Question of Scale project. And I first met Tommy over 20 years ago when we were both uh, members of the coordinating body of the Dublin Food Co-op. Uh, he's been a trade unionist and a professional trainer for over 30 years, specialising in sustainable enterprise. So welcome, Tommy. Tommy, the of approach has a rich tradition in Ireland, especially in the agricultural sector, uh, but a more community cooperative approach was embraced in Donegal by McDwyer in the 50s. What, what do you think we can learn from his work today uh, in strengthening our regional resilience? Well, uh, I think we can learn a hell of a lot because uh, Father James McDwyer was a, a revolutionary man, really. And he, in fact, he called himself on the Late Late Show a Christian communist which is a, probably a bit of an oxymoron, <laughs> but that's what he, and he was, uh, he had worked in the uh, uh, South, um, in, in, in London during the war. He, and then came back to Donegal. He was a Donegal man. And he was, uh, uh, first of all, on Tory Island. And then he was appointed the parish priest of Glen Cullum Kill. But he was, a, he had a very farsighted guy. He had known about the course, the previous cooperative efforts in agriculture, particularly the work of uh, Horace Plunkett and the work of A.E. Russell in establishing uh, the farmers co-ops. As you know, all of the a lot of the smaller dairies and farmers co-ops were started in the 20s and 30s, uh, where farmers put their their meager. Uh, 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 funds into setting up their own creameries, which sadly a lot of them are now closed or have been taken over by giants like uh, Larry Goodman or whatever, and then closed down. Um, so uh, he was promoting that tradition to continue that tradition uh, in in this very remote area of Donegal, which I don't know whether anybody knows Glen Cullum Kill, but if you you have to first of all get to to Killy Banks. From them, and then uh, it's over the mountains into this very remote part through Kilcar. So MacDyre had this idea of uh, stopping emigration. Donegal had a, a long, long history of emigration to Scotland and England in particular, and all over the world, of course, but uh, particularly the relationship with Scotland. And he said, you know, we should introduce our own industries to promote local um, uh, jobs. And he did that. He started off with um, a different uh, scale. I mean, now, there was a Gaelter Aaron project started in 1955, a, a knitting cooperative, which um, McDyer uh, enhanced. And then he decided we need to have a vegetable growing cooperative. So he tried to get the farmers. Now, he, farmers were reluctant to give lease 
their land for the vegetable corn, but he did persuade them and got a, a vegetable factory up and running, which has now been tra uh, transformed into a, a fish processing factory. As you know, Donegal is probably is the the biggest uh, fishing port in Ireland, and uh, that's still going. And I think there's about 110 people employed in that to this very day. Mm. So McDyer had also got the idea of developing tourism projects. So he started up the, the Folk Village, which still exists, and, and it had uh, has about 40,000 visitors up till the COVID situation, 40,000 visitors a year uh, in the, the, the Folk Village in Glen Cullen Kill. And also he, he got built... Uh, they built a lot of these holiday chalets in Glen Cullen Hill and took over the local hotel and set up the, the Glen Bay Hotel in Glen Cullen Hill. So, I mean, he was very fascinated. He also started a fishing cooperative and uh, and pr promoted these. And he, he also started a house building cooperative and built some houses um, in that area for uh, returning emigrants who coming back from Scotland and, and, and the UK in, gen in general. Um, so he was a very, very revolutionary man for the first time. Tommy, did, did McDyer know what was going on in Mondragon? I mean, it was a similar time. He was also a priest. Uh, did he have any, do you know if he had any recollection or was inspired at all by what was happening in, in the Basque country? I, I don't really know whether he, he knew what was happening. As you say, that was also started by a priest. Um, no, I don't think he did in, the, in, that, in that sense. Uh, I know because I met McDerr twice myself uh, in, in the 70s and uh, I found him very inspiring, I, although he was regarded as quite authoritarian in his approach, which a lot of priests were at the time. Uh, but, I mean, he, he there's been various studies done. I mean, it, it, the, some of the uh, civil servants who he was looking for grants and supports to set up his various cooperatives, uh, they were very suspicious of him because they, they, they actually said, and it's in the records, that they were afraid that if his cooperative was very successful and, and was getting subsidies for rural areas, that other rural areas would try to copy what McDyer was doing. And they and then they would also be requiring subsidies. So, I mean, he, they, 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 these notes have been discovered more recently in, in the archives. But uh, he was a, quite a revolutionary man at the time. So just to find Finish then, um, Tommy. What do you think we might learn from his work? Is there any lessons for today and where we're at today, uh, especially in this notion that we're trying to look at being more resilient in our regions? Yes, I think uh, the, the book by Lee McGinley, which was uh, on MacDyer's anniversary that about 10 years ago, I think, that Lee McGinley from Glen Colum Kale, who you, you, you've spoken to, is very very good in in and and he calls the book a revolution on their hands. Basically, he's saying that because post uh, the two thousand and eight uh, crash, that there's uh, th that this example of Macdar could be spread uh, across the whole country and elsewhere, especially. And now with the emphasis on purchasing locally, local production for local needs, which is what McDyer was trying to promote. And in a way, it's it's a, it, the, the Mondragon uh, example that you mentioned is a, more of an industrial one. But at the same time, he was encouraging local industries as well. So I think the the work of Horace Plunkett and uh, of um, Russell and, and what was it has been forgotten. A lot of the a lot of the uh, philosophy yeah. of th this cooperative endeavour uh, has been forgotten and it needs to be reactivated and pushed very strongly. Absolutely, and that's what we're trying to do through this project, A Question of Scale. Tommy, thanks for being a partner in that project and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Tommy Simpson. So in this final section, we're going to focus on emerging initiatives in the cooperative movement. So we've heard about co-ops and co-ops have been around for, for decades, uh, but there's some new, interesting, exciting co-ops emerging in more recent years, which have uh, taken on board some aspects of uh, peer to peer community and digital technologies, and also deal with uh, the labor market as it is, and might have some interesting things to say about how we can um, you know, make regions more resilient. So first of all, I'm gonna to talk to uh, Aoife Hammond. 
So Aoife is the manager of the Dublin Food Co-op. So Aoife, can you tell us a little bit about the Dublin Food Co-op, but also then tell us about uh, what you see the role for co-ops might be in strengthening local economies um, and engaging in communities? I can indeed. Um, okay, so Dublin Food Co-op is a members consumer co-op. Um, and basically what that means is we are a community of members. We've come together and um, we make the decisions about how our co-op moves and what direction it, it goes in. Our co-op is a retail co-op. So we, we have a shop based in Kilmainham. And we also have recently just launched an e-commerce shop as well, where we sell goods from our shop online and over the next year that's something that we're we're planning to expand um so yeah we started off in 1983 started out as a buying club um with a small group of friends and now we've moved to um quite a different model we've got a yeah the shop front in Kilmainham um and we've got 2800 members currently um so obviously our, <laughs> the way we operate has changed a lot but we're still operating with the same co-op principles that we have since we started off. Um, and I think in terms of how co-ops can support the local local economies, I think you've got all different co-op models. And I think that each one of those co-op models kind of does that in a different way. Obviously, we're a retail co-op. So in terms of how we interact with the local economies is a big part of that is how we deal with our suppliers. So our, one of our main focuses, one of our main aims is to actually purchase as much as possible from local suppliers, Irish suppliers. So say in 2019, we spent around 490,000 with Irish suppliers. And um, so we're ensuring that the actual, the money from within our community is actually staying within our local community as much as possible and the Irish market as, as much as possible. Um, there's other ways that we try and kind of do that within the community as well. Business to business, share, uh, like selling goods to cafes and uh, other shops as well, trying to sell wholesale to other social enterprises, other organisations um, and supporting them in terms of we've been gone since 1983. And um, so supporting other co-ops and other social enterprises as well. Um, to actually get off the ground. Um, we have supported a number of kind of co-ops to get up on their, on their feet, the urban co-op in Limerick, um, just in terms of resources. Um, they managed to actually be able to get all of their stuff delivered to DFC first because they didn't actually have a premises at the start. So I think when that started off a couple of years ago, they actually got their stuff delivered and then they drive down to, to Limerick. Um, and then... I guess on the effect within the local community, I think credit unions is something that's, you know, they're not often thought of as cooperatives because it's something that is, it's so so much built into our, um, our community. I think there's around 320 or more credit unions in all of Ireland, um, but they play a huge part in our economy um, and a lot of the, the funding that comes through cooperatives is spent within the local context. So I think that's a really important thing to think of when you're thinking about co-ops and, and the economy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just mention, did you integrate any new or innovative technologies as well um, in how you run what you do in Dublin Food Co-op with 2,800 members, but only a small shop front? It must be a bit of an undertaking. <laughs> it is, I think, innovative um <laughs> innovative technology is is interesting to to look at because we're actually just updating our point of sale system for the first time and i think about 15 years um <laughs> and we were we were using like an open source uh point of sale um and now we're we're going down a different route um we're actually taking on the one that the urban co-op in limerick is using so that's a, a good resource sharing there um i think in terms of the web stuff that we're doing and um, we're just building that now um, and what we've done so far in terms of kind of dealing with um, the membership I think yeah we have a footfall of about a thousand three hundred people uh, each week through the shop um, and 
I think we've had to adopt, I guess, to market demands. At, at one point, we were open three three days a week. Now we're open seven days a week. Our, our technology hasn't changed so much so far, but it is something that we've been investing in really only in the in the past year. Um, and I think that we're going to see that see the effects of that with the new e-commerce platform. It's the aim for next year with our community development program. Um, obviously, we launched it, our community development program last year and we obviously with COVID, it's been very much impacted. Um, with, it, was, it was all in-person training, socials and meetups and visits to other co-ops and other co-op farms. But um, now we have to look at a different way to actually create that uh, learning space. So we're actually going to bring it online um, and we're going to launch that around March or April of next year. So we're looking into uh, different types of LMSs to actually provide that training. Um, and I think that's where it's going to be interesting for us to see how, how that develops. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so, yeah, over to you, Debbie. Thanks for that, Aoife. And uh, delighted to be joined as well by Sam Toland, who's a, a cooperative advocate in Solid Network. And um, in the Question of Scale paper, uh, we introduced the Open Food Network as an example of platforms owned by their users. Sam, you've been involved in setting up the OFN uh, in Ireland, the Open Food Network. Uh, why is this approach seen as 21st century cooperatism uh, and why might it be important? Yeah, well, it, it, I suppose it's seen as 21st century in, in, in the context that it's a bit of an evolution on what we would traditionally think of as cooperatives in the 1800s and 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, there, you, you'll see as I describe it, the, the current, the, the values of 21st century cooperatism are very in line and a natural evolution of what came before. But I suppose the main kind of distinct differences or evolutions have been the kind of open multi-stakeholder nature of a lot of 21st century, like modern cooperatives, this idea of, not just serving one narrow stakeholder interest against the rest, but actually bringing all the stakeholders in. Is that the solid uh, approach? Yeah, like the, the, the term solidarity cooperative is used in places like Canada and France, and they're they're decades ahead of um, of Ireland in this. But you know, it, we're starting to get there here in Ireland as well. Um, obviously, use of innovative technologies, open source software things like this. And obviously in the case of OFN, you're talking about a digital platform cooperative. So the whole business model is absolutely rooted 100% digital technology. And that's obviously a huge departure from people's kind of typical understanding of a cooperative as their local shop or the local dairy. Um, and then following on from that, a lot of uh, modern cooperatives have taken on kind of agile, non-hierarchical kind of management and organizing structures. Which again, like you know, most cooperatives from you know the 1800s, 1900s were democratic, but they would have had a more 20th century uh, kind of representative democracy approach. Mm -hmm. And more modern cooperatives are, you know, trying. It's it's not easy, but they're trying to bring in more participative and and flat structures. And do you see a need then for rule changes in our friendly societies or cooperatives to accommodate this sort of new? agile or self-organizing or flatter uh, structures? Yeah, well, I think you know the answer to that question, Davey, very much so. Um, yes, you know, the uh, as I kind of said before, you know, the, the current kind of idea within legislation of what a cooperative is, is very rooted in that kind of 20th century kind of parliamentary democracy, Westminster approach. And that doesn't map on very well to kind of modern ideas of distributing power and management and and like you know and it's not it's not just you know ultra progressive people who want to go down that direction you go to uh silicon valley or you know any startup world and you uh, and even you know toyota toyota invented <laughs> kanban agile management you know so um yeah absolutely we need a bit of an update to say the least and what do you think sam uh what do you think uh blocks this cooperative approach i mean we've been trying to identify the barriers or the blockers of this? Is it is it mindset? Is it awareness? Is it education? Where do you see that sort of hurdle that we need to get over? Uh, it, it, it's a lot of things. There isn't just one blocker. But 
I would definitely say that one of the the biggest changes, aside from you know the, the legislation changing, would would make a big difference. But it wouldn't it wouldn't fix it alone. You know, we could have the best legislation for cooperatives in in, in the world, and it wouldn't just automatically unlock all this amazing innovation. Uh, I think it's the state actually taking an active interest in the development of a more cooperative and, and social economy. And, you know, I, I, we, do, we don't have time to get into the role of the state in probably limiting the development of cooperatives in Ireland. I, I heard to, the end of Tommy's um, uh, interview there where he was talking about how <laughs> the, the department were afraid of it being too successful because people might want to replicate it, you know. And I think that's like, that's something that you do hear from time to time. And there's plenty of stories. We talk to people over the, over the years of various departments of state thinking, gosh, we don't want uh, people getting too much control over their own <laughs> their own livelihoods or their own local communities. So um, I was actually just happened to be at the National Social Enterprise Conference today, which ran and, and co-ops were spoken about on numerous occasions and the Lockmore Community Co-op, which has replicated, I think there's 12 similar community co-ops have started in recent years. You know, and seeing the, the way that the civil servants within that um, department were proactively taking on the mantle of social enterprise. Social enterprise makes sense. The government needs to support social enterprise. The social economy is an alternative to the kind of mainstream approach to national economies. That's what we need. That's what we need. Because, you, know, you know, the government and the state have a huge role to play in setting the ground rules. Um, and, you know, if you look at what happens in local enterprise offices, Enterprise Ireland, the reality is that the current you know, investor orient, oriented businesses are subsidized to a huge degree. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you, if, if, if you and I were to try and set up a co-op tomorrow, we'd be swimming upstream, you know? So I think that's what needs to change. So maybe finally, and leaving it here, if people are interested in a cooperative social solidarity approach, where do they learn more? Yeah, well, you can go to solidcoop.ie at the minute and you can find a link where there's a group of cooperators and others working in the social solidarity economy trying to set up a network for people like us to provide mutual support and advice. Uh, and then there's a there's a number of different development bodies that could put you in the direction of from, from ICOS to cooperative alternatives. Mm. Uh, and, and reach out to the Dublin Food Co-op, you know, like we get a couple of emails every month, I'd say, from different people looking to start up cooperatives and we provide what help we can, we signpost where we can. Okay, thanks uh, Sam, thanks Aoife for joining our Question of Scale podcast um, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, so thanks to all our speakers. That was really inspiring. It was great to hear all of the different perspectives on how we can build resilience uh, in regions. So you can watch out for the paper. It'll be on the uh, GEF website. Uh, it'll be on the Cultivate website. It'll be on the Green Foundation Ireland website. Uh, listen out for uh, further updates from us. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, keep an eye on what we're doing. This is our first podcast from uh, the We Create Centre in Clock Jordan. We hope to have many others. Just thanks again from the Green European Foundation for the support, for the collaboration of all the contributors to the paper and look out for that longer illustrated uh, question of scale paper where we explore uh, the social solidarity collaborative economy in Ireland. Thanks all. Thank you.